Well, our next big focus is Volodymyr Zelensky turning into an autocrat. This question is buzzing in Kyiv, courtesy Vitaly Klitschok. Uh, for those who don't know him, Klitschok is a former boxing champion who currently serves as the mayor of Kyiv. He has said that Zelensky is becoming increasingly autocratic, so much so that he is pushing Ukraine to a point at which it will no longer be different from Russia. Allow me to quote an exact remark which he made during an interview to Swiss media. He says, people are beginning to see who's effective and who's not. And there were and still are a lot of expectations. Zelensky is paying for mistakes he has made. At some point, he will no longer be any different from Russia, where everything depends on the whim of one man. This criticism is unprecedented. Ever since the war started, not many voices in Ukraine have questioned Zelensky. Those who have, have mostly been at odds with him for quite some time. This includes the Kyiv's mayor, Kyiv's mayor himself. Since last winter, he has been questioning Zelensky's leadership. Why? Because Zelensky once accused him of failing to maintain Kyiv's bomb shelters. The report on your screen tells you the story. This is why Zelensky reprimanded uh, the mayor over the state of Ukraine's bomb shelters. This was after the death of three people who were locked out on a street during a Russian air raid. So clearly, Kyiv's mayor certainly has a reason to question Zelensky. But even if this criticism stems from his personal differences, is there merit to what he's saying? Is Zelensky really turning into an autocrat? Well, it helps to look at what people of Ukraine think. According to an internal Ukrainian poll, Zelensky's trust ratings have dropped. Here's what data shows. It says Zelensky's trust ratings have fallen to 32%. At the same time, the ratings of the commander-in-chief of the Ukrainian Armed Forces, Valery Zaluzhny, have become almost twice as high. It stands at an impressive 70%. And why is that? Because many have seen Zelensky, uh, Zaluzhny as a better alternative to Zelensky. It could also be because of his ongoing feud with the Ukrainian leader. Now, the mayor of Kyiv is not the only one Zelensky has differences with. He is also at odds with Ukraine's top military commander. Why? Because he recently said that the war is at a stalemate, that it has barely shifted despite months of fierce fighting. How did Zelensky respond to this? Well, his office issued a public rebuke saying the commander for, uh, well, also chastising the commander for making such remarks publicly. The bottom line is this, the president of Ukraine is indeed facing backlash within Ukraine's corridors of power. From his generals to government officials, they're all questioning his actions, accusing him of abusing his power and being out of touch with reality. What's worse, Zelensky is also being abandoned by his allies. Look at a report on your screen. It says the U.S. is running out of time and money to help Ukraine fight its war against Russia. This is according to the White House. The report says that recently the White House budget director, Shalanda Young, wrote a letter to the Republican Speaker, Mike Johnson, warning him about the likelihood of coffers running dry. Here's the exact quote. I want to be clear. Without congressional action, by the end of the year, we run out of resources to procure more weapons and equipment for Ukraine and to provide equipment from U.S. military stocks. There is no magical part of, uh, part of funding available to meet this moment. Uh, we are out of money and nearly out of time. What made the budget director say this? The fact that funds for Ukraine are yet to be approved. Well, since Republicans took over the House, no funds have been approved for Ukraine. The Democrats have been pushing for it, but to no avail. Things have gotten so bad that Zelensky has been invited to address the U.S. senators. Yes, he will be addressing them virtually on Tuesday. This is apparently a part of a classified briefing to hear what is at stake. This briefing will also feature U.S. national security officials. Why was this briefing required? It is because American officials want to review their aid to Ukraine. Is it because there is a war fatigue setting in? Has America become tired of the war? 
does it now want to deal with Zelensky on its own terms? These are the sort of questions being asked. The U.S. Secretary of State has allayed these fears. He says there is no sense of fatigue when it comes to support for Ukraine. He added that America must and will continue to support Ukraine. Here's hoping it would because things are clearly not working in Zelensky's favor. Our next report is from Pakistan. It seems to be witnessing an unusual trend, a trend of terrorists dying mysteriously. We've been reporting on this for weeks, how scores of terrorists have either died or have been shot dead or have disappeared. The list only seems to be growing. In the last 24 hours, we have got reports of one terrorist dying and the other mysteriously falling sick. The first one was Sajid Mir, a member of the Pakistan-based lashkar e Toiba, who was wanted for his involvement in the 2611 attacks. Reports say he has been poisoned, that too, inside a prison. As per initial details, he was immediately airlifted by the Pakistan army to a hospital. Imagine that. The army airlifting a terrorist. This could only happen in Pakistan. In any case, Sajid Mir is in hospital, apparently on a ventilator, fighting for his life. We're awaiting more details. And as the flight, as he fights for his life, another terrorist has died in Pakistan. His name was Lakbir Singh. The self-styled chief of two banned outfits, the Khalistan Liberation Force and the International Sikh Youth Federation. Interestingly, he was also the nephew of the slain Khalistani terrorist Jarnail Singh. He was listed as an individual terrorist in India and has fled to Pakistan. His family has now confirmed his death. Here's a statement from his brother. We have been informed by the son of my brother, Lakbir Singh, that he died of a heart attack in Pakistan and has been cremated there. He was highly diabetic. Uh, his two sons, a daughter and wife, live in Canada. Now, here's the thing. These killings are striking because, like I said earlier, Pakistan has been witnessing multiple incidents of terror, terrorists dying mysteriously. If we go by reports, a total of 21 of them have died this year. Let's show you a video. It's from two weeks back from Pakistan's Punjab province. The video shows two Lashkar terrorists being shot in broad daylight. The incident caused major unrest among the local population. This killing came just two hours after a Jaish-e commander terrorist was killed in Pakistan. His name was Molana Rahim Ullah Tariq. He was also apparently a close aide of Masood Azhar. On November 13, the Jaish-e terrorist was shot dead in Karachi's Orangi town. According to Pakistani media reports, Tariq was one on his way to attend a religious gathering when unidentified men opened fire on him. Three days uh, before this, on the 10th of November, another lashkar -e recruiter and commander, Akram Singh Ghazi, Akram Khan Ghazi was gunned down by bike-borne assailants in Khyber Pakhtunwa. Pakistani law enforcement agencies tried to point fingers at India, but Pakistani news outlets said in fighting within the factions led to his murder. And then on November 7th, another key member of the lashkar e -Toyba, Khwaja Shahid was abducted and later found beheaded. He was believed to be involved in the 2018 terror attack on the Indian Army camp in Jammu and Kashmir's Sunjuwan. Now it doesn't end here. On October 10th, uh, Shahid Latif, a Jaish e Mohammed terrorist and mastermind of the 2016 Pathan court attack, was killed. He was killed by three masked gunmen. On September 30th, Mufti Kesar Farooq, a close aide of the lashkar e -Toyba chief, Hafiz Saeed, was gunned down in Karachi. On September 12th, the lashkar e -Toyba terrorist Zia ur Rahman was killed while he was out on for a stroll. Uh, and on the 6th of May, Paramjeet Singh Panjwar, one of India's most wanted criminals and the head of Khalistan commando force, was gunned down in Lahore. So you have Khalistanis, you have the Islamic extremists, they're all biting the dust in Pakistan, getting killed in their own playing field. What explains this? Are Pakistani terrorists now at war with themselves? Are these killings the result of some inter-gang rivalries? Whatever be the case, one thing's clear, these killings are not happening out of the blue. There certainly has been a trigger that has resulted in these cases. And this begs the question, have their deaths saved them from facing justice, from being brought to book for their 
updates. Five days prior to the most devastating attack in Israeli history, a warning possibly emerged on the stock exchanges. The fact that some individuals within the Israeli security establishment might have had prior knowledge about the Hamas attack is now common knowledge. Yet, it is becoming apparent that certain investors who were aware of it in advance racked up millions of dollars in profits from the terror attack. This is our cover story, where we are exposing the vultures of war. You see, the Israeli authorities are currently probing allegations put forth by two U.S. researchers. They say that certain investors exploited information about Hamas's attack plans to make themselves rich. How? By short-selling Israeli shares. You heard that right. They knew about Hamas's plan to attack, to abduct, and they used this knowledge to bet against the Israeli economy. A research by law professors Robert Jackson Jr. at the New York University and Joshua Mitz of Columbia University found significant short selling of shares leading up to the attacks that triggered the war. For the unversed, short sellers place bets on shares that they expect to fall in price. They pay a fee to borrow shares in a company and then sell them in the hope of buying them back at a lower price thereby pocketing the profit. So how did the researchers find this out? They cited short selling of an exchange traded fund that broadly tracks the performance of the Israeli stock exchange that suddenly and significantly spiked on October 2nd. Now that was five days before Hamas launched the attack in the south of Israel, triggering the war. Just before the attack, short selling of Israeli securities on the Tel Aviv stock exchange increased dramatically. The researchers looked at the Israeli exchange traded fund. It is, common, it is a common way for people to make investments in Israel. On any given day, it has around 2,000 shares sorted. But on October 2nd, that shot up over 227,000 shares. The researchers who detected this trading activity described it as extremely unusual. It was profitable. The shares sold short for one Israel company alone yielded a profit of nearly $900,000. Now the two professors conducted a series of comparisons. They scrutinized data spanning over the past 13 years to determine if similar patterns emerged prior to other big moments of instability in Israel. Their aim was to validate their observations, so they drew parallels with events such as the 2014 Israel-Gaza war, the COVID-19 pandemic, and more recently the judicial reform initiative of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, which prompted millions of Israelis to take to the streets in protest. They found that the short-selling activity in early October was really extraordinary. Even when you compare it to those periods of instability, which were many. Something similar had happened before, though. On October 3rd, I beg your pardon, April 3rd, a couple of days before the Jewish holiday of Passover, the study links uh, this to an Israeli media report claiming Hamas had initially planned its attack for the eve of Passover. You know what they found? It was almost the same magnitude. What are the odds? Well, all of this uh, led them to their conclusion that trades were not a coincidence, but a tactic by someone who knew the attack was coming. The researchers say it's virtually impossible that all this happened by chance. Now, the next piece of the puzzle is if to figure out who was betting against the Israeli economy. Who are the vultures profiteering from a tragedy? How did they know about Hamas's plan to attack? Well, the truth is is finding out exactly who made the trades and who earned the profit is exceedingly difficult. Even the researchers are pessimistic. It's not so easy. To stop this sort of trading from happening is really problematic. Instead, the researchers who detected the unusual activity suggest a different agenda. They say that what we really need to be asking is how do we internalize this sort of trading information in the public conscience? Uh, from, from an intelligence standpoint, from a policy standpoint, what are these signals? What are they teaching us? That's a good starting point.
There's growing evidence of a massive intelligence failure that preceded the October 7th attacks. For example, just last week, an Israeli soldier told an American news outlet that her team reported unusual activity on the Gaza side of the border. Her team detected unusual activity six months before the attack took place. She reported it to her seniors and superiors in the Israeli Defense Forces, but she wasn't taken seriously, a missed signal, of course. Similarly, five days before the attack took place, which triggered this ongoing war, the stock market was screaming. There was something going on, yet they missed it. How is Israel responding to this revelation? They are investigating it. In response to the new study, the Israeli security authorities said that the matter is known and is under investigation. But the question is, so many clues, yet the attack took place. Israel was caught unpre unprepared when Hamas launched its assault. Israeli families grappled with the abduction of their loved ones. And as a result, Palestinians and Gaza bore the brunt of the Israeli forces. Nearly 16,000 Palestinians have died in Gaza due to Israel's relentless campaign to eliminate Hamas. Perhaps the individual truly benefiting from this war is the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Despite all the failures and public outcry, the war has given him a justification to remain in power. Before the conflict started, he faced charges of fraud, bribery, breach of trust in three cases filed in 2019. In fact, on Monday, a corruption trial resumed against him after a two-month pause. He, of course, did not attend the hearing. If convicted, if convicted in the bribery case, he faces up to 10 years in prison or fines.